Thank you very much, General. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to stand up here and present to you a topic that I'm passionate about, sensors. Um, and my topic is on the optronics radar and RFEW, your eyes and ears in the battlefield. Now, over the years here at the CSIR, we've developed capabilities. This is now specifically us in terms of radar and electronic warfare, uh, as well as optronics. We've, we've developed capabilities independently uh, for surveillance, <coughs> building, building, building uh, blocks for, for building surveillance capabilities, as well as building electronic warfare effectiveness test and evaluation uh, capabilities. These are the capabilities that allows us to understand the threat um, so that we can develop uh, countermeasures, you know, to defeat the threat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's sad to say that the, um, the threat environment has moved on. The threat environment has advanced. While we were busy developing capabilities independently, the threat environment is now integrated. You've got now the missiles, uh, missile seekers that have both RF and electro-optical capabilities. Um, to even go further, you have now sensors or threat sensors that are networked, you know. So you've got fusion at the platform at, at sensor level. Um, and then you've got network sensors uh, or network threats that are attacking you. So how do you manage this lot? Um, so the time has come now to, to move into the field of integrated optronics, radar, and RFEW capabilities from a surveillance perspective as well as from an EW electronic warfare effectiveness test and evaluation capability. So my talk will be uh, two parts. The first part is a rather dark part where I explore the threat environment. How does it look like currently? Then the second part is now the lightning, the, the part that brings in the light. What does the solution look like? What can it look like? But my message is simple. We need to make a move quickly. The threat environment is advancing so fast uh, that if we don't make the necessary changes now uh, to ensure that we have the capability uh, to combat the threat, we will lose the battle. We will lose the battle. So if you look at the outline of my talk, I will look into the nature of the battle space currently. I will focus specifically on the African environment, given that our defense force uh, is getting deployed there increasingly for peace support missions um, and so on. Then I will move into the, the spectrum of a potential conflict in, the, in, the, in this African continent of ours. What does it look like? And I mean, that, that already gives you an idea in terms of the capabilities that you need in order to operate in that environment. And then now move on into the solution space, you know, bringing some light into, the solu into, the, into my talk um, in terms of what, what is being done and what potentially can be done in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and then I will explore some ideas, you know, for, for the integration of uh, optronics, radar, and RFEW capability. Uh, some initial concepts that we're working on currently, I will share some insights into that. So now begin the dark part of my talk. Um, if you look in terms of the South African National Defense Force, and its responsibility in terms of uh, deployments in the African environment, um, it's increasing, you know. The, it, our defense force is getting deployed in, in Africa, you know, increasingly. Um, and they get exposed in that environment to different types of threats. Um, if you look at that environment, the threat environment has a number of features or characteristics uh, which we must be aware of. If, if we are going to develop countermeasure systems, we must be aware of the, the nature of the battle space. So I want to start off with this picture here where you have 
um, civilian aircrafts being shot down as part of the uh, as part of the battle space. The battle space has moved now. It's asymmetric. Um, it's difficult to distinguish your enemy from from, from your friends. Um, civilians are becoming part of the of the casualties. If you look at the statistics, um, over the last century or so in warfare, you would have casualties um, being, 90% of casualties being male soldiers. Now the picture has changed completely. We've got now civilians uh, being part of the, uh, of the casualties. And at least 75% now of women and children are part of the, uh, uh, of the losses. So that's one part. The threat is asymmetric. Um, civilians are involved. You don't know who's who. And also, if you look at the, the shoulder launch threat, the shoulder launch missile threat, um, every time I take a flight now, I'm scared. You know, it's reported that uh, the, the lethal capability of the shoulder launch missile, you basically your aircraft is vulnerable during, during takeoff and landing. So every time, if, I, if I'm visiting Africa, every time it's taking off, I'm scared. Um, and every time we're about to land, I'm scared. Because anything can happen. The threat environment is it's uncertain, it's uncertain, it's complex. You don't know what's going to happen. Just some more pictures uh, showing now the fighter aircrafts being vulnerable as well. Um, fighter aircrafts are known you know, to have you know, the latest capabilities, combat capabilities. Um, they've got stealth, can avoid being detected, but the, the, the sensor environment has changed. Now, modern radars are able to change modes. You can go lower in frequency, and your wavelength becomes comparable to the aircraft structure, and you're able to resonate. You're able to see the aircraft, even though it has the, uh, the stealth capabilities. And more so, if, if you don't want to go low in frequency, what do you do? You have multi-static radars. Multistatic RF receivers sprinkled all around the show using uh, illuminations of uh, transmitters of opportunities that are available in, in, the, in the environment, you know, doing by static uh, reception of the, of the echoes from the targets. So now even the stealth aspect is being taken out. The, the helicopters are by far the most vulnerable because of the low speeds at which they operate to shoulder launch missiles, um, uh, I must add. So if you look at the history of uh, aircrafts being shot down from 1978 up to 1997, the picture is bleak. Um, a lot of these incidences are civilian aircrafts being shot down during dif different conflicts in the African environment. And to make the, the picture even worse, this is the old type generation type of threat. This is not even the modern type, which is integrated in terms of RF and optics. So even today, we are still vulnerable most of the aircraft are still vulnerable to the old type of, of, of uh, missile threat, where you have one uh, sensor, which is either infrared, or you can have a radar sensor on the seeker. If one now looks at the, the African continent in terms of its size, uh, if you look at this picture here, the old That yellowish color there is basically the size of China or a part of China being fitted or fitting most of the southern hemisphere of the African uh, continent. Then you've got most of the top being fitted by the United States of America. Just in terms of size, give you an idea of, of, our, com of our continent um, and then the challenges that it possesses, you know, in terms of coverage um, challenges. And then, 
that space is subdivided, it's segmented. Historically, colonialism took over and there was a lot of segmentation of the areas and that led to a number of human related issues, you know, the language issues, the ethnic issues, cultural issues that basically add to the complexity of the, of the problem. Then of course, Africa is known to be rich in minerals, even though most of our, of our people in Africa are poor, uh, but we are rich in minerals. Um, and this is a source, uh, a major source for conflict. So if you look into the future, you, you, you can still see these conflicts going on and on and on, just because of minerals, fighting over minerals. And the latest trend now is the use of the minerals as trade for armaments or during armaments acquisition, where you have a government using minerals to trade, to, to get the latest equipment. So which changes your mentality now, because typically one would say, ah, Africa, that's low tech. I should be able to cope there with my capability. But uh-uh, you can still encounter the latest threat in the African environment, modern threat. Um, because the governments have access, you, 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 they have got access to the mineral resources that they can use as well. Of course, the maritime uh, problem, maritime piracy problem still exists. Um, also, it's due to, to, to minerals as well. You know, if you look at the oil, 50% um, of the oil in Africa around in the, the Gulf of Guinea, um, and the rest of it in the eastern part of Africa. So the piracy problem still exists. And for us in South Africa, it's a, it's a concern, a major concern. Why? Because most of our trading in export and imports, 90% of it happens through the sea. The transportation happens through the sea. So it's a major risk for us. That's why we have our defense force being involved in all these... Um, deployments and these missions to help alleviate the problem. And of course, if you're dealing with piracy, they dress like a, like a civilian, you know? You're no longer fighting a war of uniform against uniform, country versus country, force against force, uh-uh. You don't even know whether this, uh, this person you're dealing with is an enemy or not. So, Again, that aspect of the asymmetric warfare and the involvement of civilians comes in maritime environment. But what's important is to have um, our forces um, ready in terms of surveillance capabilities, ready to be able to, to pick up because the, the major thing is that the pirates and even the smugglers, they use small boats because small boats are difficult to, to detect and pick up. By the time you, you pick them up, they're too close. It's too late. But if you've got the right sensors in there, you can pick them up at longer ranges and do something about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in terms of the spectrum of conflict, but what uh, is to, to note there is you, at one end, you've got a political and economical conflict where really you're not using any of your, of your equipment, armament equipment. Then at the furthest end, you've got a total war. So if you look at the defense review, the defense review says that if you look at interstate conflict, um, because of, it's less likely because of arrangements and co cooperation between nations uh, that may affect uh, the economical standings of the various, par uh, various parties that are involved. So it's, it's less likely to have this general full war, you are most likely going to end up in between, which is what we see currently. We've got uh, acts of terror, um, insurgency, and all sorts of things happening in the middle. And of course, in the middle, we're talking about the asymmetric nature. We're talking about civilians being involved. So all in all, if one looks at the, at the threat environment, we, we see that it is complex. Uh, it is complex in terms of the, the, 
the bodies that will have to be involved in terms of the various governments, even countries getting involved. Uh, there's also a possibility of the use, use of commercial of the shelf systems available, being available um, immediately. Nowadays, the trend is to have some of these Af the African countries acquire defense capabilities with contracted pilots, for example. If you have, if they're acquiring an aircraft, they'll bring an aircraft with a with pilot, which is already um, brings up the readiness level immediately. As soon as you have acquired your system, you are operational immediately. So how do we keep up with that? Our own uh, defense acquisition process takes a long time. Nowadays, it doesn't happen like that in the, in the other African um, countries. So it is asymmetrics. The civilians and the infrastructure involved is violent and fluid. Enhanced destruction, there's agility, and there's a need for you know the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capability. And now I'm moving on to the solution space, and I'm going to have to go over this quite quickly. But ultimately, what we have currently is sensors that are operating in the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you look in the middle, we have the cell phone. Everybody has the cell phone. Cell phone is key in the, in, the, in the warfare or in the modern warfare of today. We have command and control systems running on um, telecommunications infrastructure, cellular infrastructure, uh, allows to give the, the commander a situational awareness picture, just using the infrastructure in the country uh, and, and cellular infrastructure in the country. So it's operating the microwave band. Then, of course, we have the radar systems transmitting the energy into the environment and processing the echoes from that and being able to determine the, the distances, the ranges of the various targets, the speeds of the targets, as well as with modern radars today, you can distinguish between uh, a helicopter and a fixed wing aircraft with a radar today. So there, there's been huge uh, improvements in that domain. Then you have the optical environment key, especially close in distances where you have the ability to see who is doing what. You've got evidence that you can use in court. You can recognize uh, or develop algorithms to do the recognition of, of uh, what is the person. For example, if the person is far enough, <coughs> is, that, is, it, is that person a threat or a, uh, a friend? Does the person have a, an offensive posture about them? Is he carrying a gun at, at a far enough di distance, 5Ks and beyond? Um, that's when it kicks in. So if you look at the, the spectrum itself, there's the RF spectrum where the radars and the radio frequency receivers operate. It's getting congested. It's getting congested. In the past, what used to happen was the, the cellular bands used to be notched. The, the, the defense systems used to notch the various cellular bands. Nowadays, you can't notch them because there's information there. Your enemy might be using a, a, cellular, uh, a cellular device. And if so, who's to say that he didn't give it to his friend or someone else is using it? So the problem is still open. Uh, but now what has happened is the band has been it's open. You have to analyze typically the whole band, if you're talking RF. But if you, the wider the band, of course, the wider the band, the more information you receive about the environment, and then the more better situational awareness you can have. So we're talking about these three areas. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. But the point is they must be integrated. So if, if we're talking surveillance, we're talking integrated surveillance. If we're talking electronic warfare effectiveness, test and evaluation, the building blocks for that, it must be integrated. Because what is the point? If, you, if, if your modern threat has moved, now it's integrated. You want to understand how it operates. You better have your test and evaluation capability integrated. So at DPSS, uh, if, you, if you look at 
and our role, I mean, we, we are decent capability for, for, for the DOD. And capability is three things. It's the people, the infrastructure, and the processes. And you need to look at all three of those. So if you look at those capabilities so far, they've been being developed independently. Optronics, RF, and radar independently. Now we need to talk integrated capabilities. And if you look at uh, the dimensions of integration, there's other dimensions of integration. Industrial, co in, industrial, co industrial cooperation. Industrial collaboration now is, is, is the in thing. We want to support industry uh, to create more jobs, improve the economy of our country. So if we're building integrated capabilities, we pretty much now have to look at the Total system of innovation. Total system of innovation. You've got the universities developing the, the basic research. Then you have the research institutes maturing that research uh, in terms of applications research, getting it ready for transfer to, to industry. So there's a number of dimensions where you can do this integration. It's not only the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. Okay, I'm not going to go into, the, into this, but the, the message here is that we, we have capabilities in terms of platform self-protection, understanding the threat environment, um, using simulation and modeling, using hardware in the loop simulations, and using field test and evaluation. Those three, all integrated. Uh, why do we do that? We want to understand the threat so that we can develop the countermeasures or optimize countermeasure that already exists. So that's our platform self-protection focus. Those are the three areas that I mentioned. That's the facility that we have at Optronic Sensor Systems that now needs to be integrated with some RF in it. Once you put a seeker, this is a flight motion simulation uh, infrastructure where you can have your target mounted there and your missile seeker mounted there. So, so far it's been optics only. It's been infrared only. How do you, what are the, the challenge for the future is how do you integrate RF into that environment now? So, General, how, much, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Thank you. Also, in the, in the RF radar environment, they have these three areas as well, simulation and modeling, uh, hardware in the loop simulation as well as field test and evaluation and it's integrated as well. In the simulation environment you do things that you normally wouldn't do. You shoot missiles, you fly aircrafts, all sorts of things. You do experiments in the simulation environment. But what's important about it is that it must be, the fidelity must be at the right level. The accuracy must be at the right level. So how do you achieve that? You need to have hardware in the loop capabilities to be able to model what, what a threat is doing when you stimulate it with different signals. And you need to take the threat out in the field and actually fly aircrafts and see how the threat uh, responds to that. Put all that information together and you have a validated simulation environment that you can use for training as well. Okay, so you've got to look at all those uh, different areas. Uh, the threat, the countermeasure, the environment, as well as the aircraft. That, that's both for platform self-protection as well as surveillance. We're, we are in the business of building, building blocks for surveillance. The image processing, uh, the design the optics for that specific problem you're trying to solve. Design the stabilization system, where you're going to mount the sensor. So you've got to look at all those. So there's some integration concept we're working with, uh, where we have, we use the optic sensor, or the radar sensor, because with radar you can see at long distances. By the time the optic sees the, the, the threat coming in, you can, then, uh, you can then direct the optical sensor or slave the, the, the optical sensor onto the radar to follow where the target is going. So I'll jump into conclusions now. Um, 
the whole message behind my presentation is that the time, the time has, has arrived. We need to make a move now. We, over the years, we've developed this capability independently. We need to now integrate it to make sure that uh, we are still relevant in terms of the threat out there. The threat is integrated. It means the capability that we use to understand the threat, to detect the threat, it must also be integrated. So that's where I'm going to leave it, Jenna. Thank you very much.